Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about social driving, the interaction of drivers and other road users on the highway uh, to drive and be predictable and to try and not crash while you're on the roads. So that's what we're talking about tonight and that's what we're doing. And we're getting started here a little bit early because I wanted to make sure that everything was working because Friday night I came home to my computer to find out I couldn't log in and I spent all Friday night from 9 o'clock until about midnight and then all day Saturday, all day Saturday trying to get it to work again. So I just wanted to make sure that everything was working fine. So uh, Corey, is everything seem to be working all right there, the video and the sound and everything? Because yeah, that was a bit taxing with my new computer to make sure that everything was working properly. So. C Pain, how are you? Muhammad is here. Sam is here. At least Sam left some comments. I typed back, but he wasn't here. So, yeah. And uh, essentially, what I want to talk about here for a couple minutes, just until people show up and we get up to six o'clock here. Hi, Gordon. Uh, is uh, yeah, like I said, I, I want to talk about social driving, and I want to talk about how social driving adds a layer to your driver's license and how it makes it more difficult to drive for the purposes of a road test comments aren't up yet yes Corey thank you excellent that's why I got started here early there we go there we go perfect thank you Corey so they're there now and the other thing is hi Sam uh, the other thing is is YouTube has made some changes to the live stream I'm, I'm excited about these changes that YouTube has made to the live stream First of all, the comments are going to stay with the video when it's posted on YouTube. So even though I have the replay here and it'll go up, uh, YouTube will attach the comments to it. So we're going to have a look at that. I don't know how this is going to work out with the comments on OBS because I might get a duplicate of the comments when the video comes up on replay. So I might have to just repost it, uh, which just adds another layer of work for me. Uh, all about vehicles, how are you? Uh, I'm trying to remember your name. It's it's Kieran or Keenan. <laughs> I'm sorry. It has, been, it has been a long couple of days. As I said, I was fighting with my computer all day yesterday and Friday night to try and get it working. So just, just remind me, please forgive me. Oh, my brain is not working well. So, okay, so it is six o'clock. So, hi Hannah, how are you? Hannah's here, and uh, as I was saying previously, for those of you, you who just joined us, uh, my computer crashed on Friday night. I spent three hours on Friday night from 9 to midnight trying to get it working, and then all day Saturday on the phone with Apple. I think I was on the phone for Keenan. Yes, there we go. I got it right. I, I do apologize about that, Keenan. So, uh, yeah, so I spent all day yesterday trying to get my computer working, and so I'm happy to see that everything's more or less working. Essentially, what I had to do was erase the disk and then restore everything. Unfortunately, I've got backups and whatnot. But when you buy a brand new computer and it's three months old, it does that to you. It's, it's somewhat frustrating. So tonight, what we're talking about is social driving and the layer of complexity this adds to a driver's license because Ernesto is from Chile. Hello, Ernesto. That is really terrific. So social driving, and social driving is different depending on what country you're in, you know, because in Australia they have lots of roundabouts, uh, they have a different attitude towards police, they have lots of speed cameras and those types of things. So, so the social driving is different in Australia than it is here. One other thing that denotes Australia as being different is, is that in Australia, it is okay to drink and drive as long as your blood alcohol is not above 0.5. So it is not unusual to see people in Australia with a can of beer between their legs while they're driving their vehicle. So there's lots of other people here to say hi. Frank is here. <laughs> Frank is here from Michigan on the thumb of Michigan. Brianna's here. And that is really great. Thanks, Brianna. Uh, MM Monster passed the test on February 23. Thank you so much for that. Rohan is here. Uh, Fawaz is here. <laughs> Geenan, yeah, it does happen to everyone. Unfortunately, you don't like it happening when it's a brand new computer. Uh, Rohan is from Winnipeg. That's really great. Okay, so we're going to talk about social driving. We're going to talk about the complexity, and I was talking about some of the hallmarks of social driving in Australia. 
as opposed to here in Canada. It's a little bit different here in Canada with social driving. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, but essentially my theory, my thesis is, is this adds another layer of complexity to you getting your license because uh, it's something that you have to deal with for the purposes of a license. And yes, Edwin, hi there. And Gordon is here, Metropolitan India it is bumper to bumper. Yes, and there are other places in the world where indeed it is. Michael is here. So that's what we're talking about in terms of social driving. And it's a little bit difficult to talk about social driving without sort of touching on the culture of driving and things that talk about uh, culture. But essentially what I want to talk about is social driving tonight. And uh, everybody will have something to help with the conversation here and the discussion of what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Keenan, yes. 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So that is a little bit different. Yes. And uh, for those people who are here and miss, and I didn't get the, I was going to do a webinar on Saturday morning. I do apologize about that. And uh, if you weren't, if you are here and you weren't, you missed, you wanted to see that webinar on air brakes, send me an email and I'll get you hooked up here. Okay. So Michael passed his road test in February. That is awesome. Brianna is from Las Vegas and does not like driving in Las Vegas. <laughs> Why is that that you don't like driving in Las Vegas, Brianna? Just leave me a comment there. All right, so without further ado, we're kind of getting going here pretty quick here. I am going to switch over to the PowerPoint presentation and get that going for you and talk about social driving. Okay, um, just bear with me while I transition here. Okay, um, that up there, that down there, and here we go. So social driving, uh, I was talking about some of the hallmarks of social driving, and it's interesting that there's a term anti-social driving, which is defined as driving that is careless, deliberately aggressive, or dangerous. Now, some of the things I'm going to talk about in terms of social driving may not necessarily be driving to get along with other drivers, but it was interesting that there was this term because we have this term anti-Americanism, which is a common term that if you don't do certain things in the United States of America, uh, you're not American. And it's anti-Australian. There's a, a term anti-Australian as well. But interestingly enough, in other countries of the world, in Canada here, for example, we don't have that term. So there's a term social driving, which what we can do and what we get do to get along when we're driving and those types of things. And there's the, con the adverse term anti-social driving, which is driving behavior that is seen to be against the norms of driving, you know, uh, speeding, talking on your phones, aggressive and dangerous behavior and those types of things. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in terms of social driving. Uh, yeah, here we go. So we get on the right slide here, page down. Rick, I am Rick August. For those of you who don't know me or haven't seen any of my videos, uh, I was a truck driver through most of the 1990s. I uh, became a licensed driving instructor in 1997. So I've been a driving instructor for just about more than two years. 2006, I earned my doctorate from the University of Melbourne in legal history. And for those of you who don't know, legal history is the study of policing, courts, and prisons. And my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. And while I was in Australia, because I did my doctorate at the University of Melbourne, I drove buses there for a year before I started my doctorate for Greyhound and then I went on to drive for V-Line, uh, which is a regional bus line that connects up the um, interstate train stations and basically that's all I did for a year there. So that's my background in driving and I, you know, kind of geek out on traffic and policing and those types of things. Uh, this was the one video that I did get up this week. Unfortunately, I didn't get the other video up on Saturday and I do apologize about that. Uh, T-bone crashes and I talked about this crash and the difficulty that uh, you know the the dangers inherent in T-bone crashes and what and analyzed why the crash happened and those types of things and talked about flashing traffic lights and the importance of slowing down and at least having a look before you proceed through an intersection on a flashing traffic light. Uh, neither one of these vehicles stopped and it was a very deadly crash and unfortunately I think somebody died in that crash because it nobody emerged from the vehicles in the aftermath of that crash. All right, so defining social driving. Social driving is the interaction of drivers and other road users on the roadway and how they interact and how they drive and the driving behaviors that are acceptable amongst 
drivers in North America. When we're talking mostly about North America, I'll talk a little bit about Europe and talk about Australia. Uh, for example, we don't come to complete stops at stop signs. We don't do the speed limit. We're after, often driving five to 10 miles an hour above the posted speed limit, or we're uh, driving 10 to 20 kilometers an hour above the posted speed limit for those of us that are in metric. Uh, in the traffic flows, we tend to drive in groups. We tend to drive really close to other vehicles instead of maintaining our space and trying to drive uh, with a buffer of space around us. Uh, oftentimes when we turn left or right onto multi-lane roads, we don't signal when we change lanes and those types of things. And oftentimes we don't change lanes correctly after we get our license. We simply just, you know, signals are kind of to tell people that we are moving over, not that we wish to move over. Uh, many people accelerate towards yellow lights and they'll do U-turns and those types of things. And, you know, in some aggressive cases, they will not give way to pedestrians and those types of things. Now, interestingly enough, all of these social driving behaviors are the very behaviors that are the top three reasons for crashes, which are speeding, following too close, and failing to yield. Those are the top three reasons for traffic crashes. So all of those are part and parcel of our driving behavior within our society and what I define as social driving, the acceptable behaviors on the roadway. And I'm sure that when we have the discussion here in the aftermath of the presentation, that some of you will have your own uh, hallmarks of social driving, things that drivers do on the roadway that are socially acceptable, that are done all the time. Now, one of the things that engineers and traffic safety experts and the evolution of traffic, the engineering of traffic is, is that two ways we keep road users and other vehicles away from each other is either is through demarcations. And the big word is temporal demarcation, which is basically time. And we demarcate traffic through the use of manipulating time. And time is the best example of time is traffic lights, is that one uh, flow of traffic has to stop and wait for the other cross traffic to go through and then that traffic stops and then the other traffic goes through and other road users can use the intersection at the same time, pedestrians and cyclists and those types of things. So that's temporal demarcations and then of course we have spatial demarcations. We have a certain amount of space, physical space on the roadway that allows us to separate opposing lanes of traffic, uh, allows us to build sidewalks and footpaths and those types of things and keep pedestrians away from cars and those types of things. And it's interesting that when you're on a driver's license or a road test, you have to adhere to all of the laws of the road when social driving dictates that most of the time they're kind of guidelines when we're driving. So for example, on a road test, you have to stop at the correct position at a stop sign intersection or a traffic light. You have to stop before the crosswalk line before the stop line or before where the two edges of the two roads meet. As you can see here in this image of the taxi cabs in New York, none of those vehicles are stopped, well, like only a few of those vehicles are stopped behind the actual stop lines where you were required to stop for the purposes of the road test. So it's very difficult for new drivers who are learning to drive because they're looking and watching everybody else who is driving and they're getting exactly the wrong message from the rest of the drivers on the roadway. They're all saying, oh, you don't have to stop at the stop line and these types of things. And you can just sort of push your way through the intersection, which is obviously what these taxi cabs are doing coming around on that left hand turn. Those taxi cabs are choking up the intersection, which if they're in Manhattan proper, that's actually illegal because there's a, a, a fine for causing gridlock in New York. Now, one of the other things, one of the other reasons that we speed as drivers is because it's seen as a victimless crime. If we speed, it is socially more devastating for us to be late for a meeting with somebody else to get to work on time and those types of things. So therefore, speeding is seen as a victimless crime and in the hierarchy of things that we do wrong in our life, it's seen as more wrong when we're late for work or we're late for a meeting and it's more socially acceptable to speed in our vehicles than it is to be late for a meeting. And this is one of the reasons why a lot of people speed and this is the other reason why a lot of people uh, in traffic flow and those types of things go faster than the posted speed limit and they pass and those types of things. So this is the reason why a lot of this stuff happens is because traffic violations are seen as technical crimes, they're seen as you know, victimless crimes. Nobody gets hurt. Nobody, it's, you know, no, nothing happens. And, and some of these, and I've talked about these definitions of speeding before in terms of traffic violations and those types of things. 
what is the definition of speeding? Because the definition of speeding is never easy. There's the posted speed limit, there's the traffic flow, which as I said is often 10 to 12 miles an hour faster or 10 to 20 kilometers an hour faster than the posted speed limit. Is somebody driving faster than me or are they driving faster than the conditions of the roadway will allow? So which one of those definitions is your definition of speeding and which one of those definitions is the definition of law? Because police, as I talked about a couple of weeks ago, all have a tolerance for speeding uh, and when they pull people over, they'll all, there's always a tolerance. Either it's five or 10 miles an hour above the posted speed limit or it's you know five to 12 kilometers an hour. So that shapes part of the social social driving on our roadways. Now the other thing that contributes to social driving on our roadways is vehicles as personal space. And I put all these kind of bumper stickers up here and put some interesting characteristics of what people do inside of their vehicle. Cars, people's own personal cars, especially in North America where we have private ownership, are very much seen as a personal space. Just like our houses, these are very much a personal space. And people decorate them up and they put bumper stickers on them and they put all kinds of things inside of their vehicles that reflect who they are as a person. And like houses, we, it is an expression of self, what our cars are and those types of things. And it was actually funny some years ago because I was working with an occupational therapist at the hospital and uh, she said, well, and I made this comment about people personalizing their vehicles and she said, well, I don't personalize my vehicle. And I said, well, what about the fish on the back? She had a Christian symbol of the fish on the back of her car. And she kind of looked at me and went, oh, oh yeah, I do. <laughs> so even things that some people don't think about, it is uh, an expression of themselves in terms of their vehicle. Now, the other thing about being in their vehicle is, is that a lot of people are free and protected by the, the very comfort of the inside of their vehicle that they express their rawest emotions in their vehicle. And this is where road rage originates from and anger. People get tired, they're going to work all of the time, they've got kids and responsibilities and they're running their kids all over town and those types of things and they're always in a hurry and never kind of take a break or step back for a minute and they that road rage manifests itself in their vehicle because of the demands of our, our society and, and because of the fact that we're in this sealed metal box we can do that and this is where uh, you know a lot of this road rage originates from inside of our vehicles now something else that shapes speed cameras and this is from my experience of driving around uh, in different parts of the world and those types of things and in Melbourne Australia or not Melbourne Australia in Victoria Australia which is a state in Australia and in New South Wales they had speed cameras and uh, everybody drove 100 kilometers an hour or less. Nobody drove over 100 kilometers an hour in Australia because of the speed cameras. Now, in Ohio, the state of Ohio in the United States of America, uh, people rarely sped in the United States of America. Truck drivers all did 55. Uh, there was a running joke in Ohio that they said they were gonna lay off some of the state troopers in Ohio, and they were only gonna have one at every mile marker now. <laughs> so that was one of, the, one of the things that shaped social driving in these places that people did not speed or drive above the posted speed limit because of these policing measures that were in place that that formed what we called what we talked about last week was deterrence policing that people get caught for speeding and then they don't speed anymore <coughs> excuse me and then they have red red light cameras and then on the eastern seaboard of the United States of America they have tolls and again all of this shapes social driving I mean, for the rest of North America, places outside of the Eastern Seaboard, uh, outside of the metropolitan areas and those types of things, tolls, tolls are seen as a comp complete anathema for many, many drivers. They just resent uh, having to pay tolls and those types of things. So that's another aspect of driving. And uh, on the note of uh, speed cameras and those types of things, there's the story about the guy in Australia who went past the van and the police officer was sitting in there with a speed camera and the guy goes by and the light goes off and he's like he looks down at his speedometer and he's not speeding he's like well that's odd he says I'm not speeding so he goes around the block and he comes back and he goes back past the van again and he, the light goes off again he, he looks down again he's like I'm not speeding he's like I don't understand this so he goes around the block a third time and he comes back and he, he pulls up behind the van and he stops and he knocks on the door and the door the police officer opens up the door and he says uh officer he says i think your i think your speed cam is broken he says i went past here twice and the light went off and he says uh 
you know, I wasn't speeding. The police officer looks at him and goes, yeah, he says, I know you weren't speeding. He says, I booked you twice for not wearing your seatbelt. So the other aspect of this is distracted driving and talking about social driving uh, and acceptable forms of behavior. We are somehow very connected to our cell phones and people are not putting their cell phones down despite what you know the, the, the public campaigns against distracted driving. Some years ago, this was like five years ago now, the AAA, the Automobile Association of America, put out, did this study of Americans in the United States of America and in a one month period, 66% of Americans said that they had used their phone while driving in the previous month. 33% of Americans, and we're talking 100 million people here, 33% of Americans admitted to texting and driving uh, with their cell phones. So texting and driving at the same time. And then of course in our vehicles, because as I talked about in an earlier slide, we have forms of distraction people are doing all kinds of things. They're eating, they're shaving, they're putting on makeup and all kinds of other things that you probably really don't want to know about in terms of your vehicle. So some of this is seen as socially acceptable behavior. And for many people, again, it comes back to that victimless crime. If they use their cell phone while they're driving, nothing happens. Now there are rumblings of the textilizer coming out and this being implemented, which is going to increase police powers. And they're going to be able to plug into your phone and see whether you, you were using your phone in the immediate minutes and hour you know minutes before the crash if there is a crash this is what's going to increase police power so this is something else that's coming down the pipe now the other thing and i talked about this a couple of weeks ago as well in drunk driving and if you haven't seen this have a look at that video uh on the live stream where we talk about drunk driving and we talked about the reason in the late 1960s that drinking and driving had escalated to a point where it had something had to give because there were just too many crashes contributed to drinking and driving. So the police intervened, there were uh, social uh, awareness programs in terms of drinking and driving. We started to restrain drivers in the vehicles. And then we had young people who were drinking, driving, dating. And as well now we have distracted driving for all of these people. So drink driving laws have changed. And as I mentioned in the introduction with Australians, it's okay to drink and drive as long as you're not over 0.5. So there's different ideas of drinking and driving. And I mean, the other thing is, is that in restaurants, you can, in Australia, you can take booze to the restaurant and they'll open it for you. Here in Canada, we have very different ideas about drinking and driving. We have to hide booze in the trunk and those types of things and have it covered up and those types of things. We don't have it in the vehicle and whatnot. So we have, when other people come and visit us and they see us doing this, they see it as very interesting. But anyway, all of this comes into social driving because it's socially accepted as to be able to drink. And for some people, they cannot monitor their ability to drive. Now, the other thing in terms of drink driving, and I should have called this slide intoxication because other people are smoking. And I mean, this is one of the things that's coming on board now is, is that people are taking illegal drugs and they're driving. And then of course, the number one reason why people are intoxicated while they're drinking or while they're driving is because of prescription medication. This is the number one reason why people are intoxicated while they're driving is prescribed medication and over the counter medication. So all of this is seen as socially acceptable because most of us, you know, not most of us, but a lot of us in society are on some sort of medication and that's going to impair your ability to drive. I keep getting that slide in there. So that's essentially it. So essentially what I wanted to talk about in terms of social driving is, is there are behaviors that are acceptable on our roadways that are acceptable. And for those of you who are taking a road test, it, you cannot look at other people who are driving as an example of how you drive because when you go for a road test, what is expected of you on a road test is very different from what's going to be accept, expected of you after you get your license. Because if you start, if you keep your license and you st you do the posted speed limit and you stop at every stop sign or traffic light and you don't get up and go when you're doing a left-hand turn at a multi-lane highway and those types of things, other people are going to honk at you and those types of things. So that's essentially what I wanted to say. And hopefully we can have a discussion about this and other people can sort of indicate some of the hallmarks of what they see as social driving and how that complicates getting your license. So good luck in your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Okay, and I'll just transition back over here. Just one moment. And put the comments back up. There we go. All right.
<laughs> Sebastian. How did I deal with arrogant veteran drivers? Uh, Sebastian, you just back off, you know, and the, and the thing about this is last week, uh, and you know something, it's, I, I have to remind myself to put my dash cam in the vehicle every time I get in the vehicle because I went out and sure enough, I'm driving down the road and I'm just kind of rolling up to the red light. I wasn't, you know, and I was slowing down and of course somebody in a big pickup, you know, jacked up Chevy pickup was behind me and they go screaming around me and up to the light and they make a right hand turn. Well, they only beat me to the light and uh, you know, I just backed off, just let them go and have their crash somewhere else, you know, and that's all you can do. Uh, Muhammad, how long is the expiration of a driver's license in and learning driver's license? You only have a year and then it expires. Okay, Ernesto, thank you so much for that. <laughs> Sam, did I say two years? Yeah, two decades. <laughs> Brianna, well that's great. We're happy to hear that you're doing well in your long drives there. Gordon, the top three reasons for crashes are three out of ten wrong moves tracks taxi drivers do. <laughs> okay. Rohan, uh, you can just post them below. Rohan, you can just post them below a video there, and I'll get to you and I answer those for you. Uh, Muhammad, how much is the fine for the phone? It's it depends what province you're in. You'd have to look that up, but it is pretty high for sure. I'll let you know. I'll tell you that for sure. Fawaz, thank you for that. Uh, Ibukun, yes, thank you for that. And you are most welcome for that. We're glad that it's helping out there. Uh, Rush Girl. Okay, I just I just answered that question, Rush Girl, about uh, impatient and aggressive drivers. Just keep your space. Uh, just keep your calm. I know it's difficult when other people are you know, pushing you and wanting you to go and those types of things. But eventually, if you're on a multi-lane highway, they're just gonna go around and pass you and then just let them go and have their crash somewhere else because it is really not you worth you getting excited about them and those types of things. Tommy, what is, uh, what is ex considered a socially acceptable speed in an 80 kilometer an hour zone? So that's essentially 55, or that's essentially 50 kilometer, 50 miles an hour, 80 kilometers an hour is 50 miles. And a socially acceptable speed, Tommy, is 90 kilometers an hour. The police will not even go near you at 90 kilometers an hour. You might even, it depends on where you are, what the characteristics of the road are. You might even be able to do 100, but it would depend on where you are. Okay, but usually you can do 90 and they're not even gonna bother you. Okay, Riley. Uh, what would you plan to do if everybody's doing 10 to 20 miles an hour above the posted speed limit yet there are police SUVs hanging around the corner? So Riley, uh, in terms of that, where are you? Are you on the interstate and people are doing that? Because if you're on the interstate or um, the expressways, then that's socially acceptable. Uh, the police are probably not going to pull you over for that. Uh, Sebastian, I was talking about passenger veteran drivers who the arrogant veteran driver there's uh, okay so somebody so what you're talking about Sebastian is actually somebody inside the vehicle with you a passenger in the vehicle is that what you're talking about uh, Brianna break <laughs> Ibukun you asked me that once before <laughs> I wouldn't try doing driving barefoot in your vehicle if you're on a road test okay otherwise you know knock yourself out you might want to get some moccasins or something if you're gonna if you like doing that in your vehicle. Uh, Edwin, intersections, turning in certain spots and getting on the interstate is what gets me nervous. Yeah, and Edwin, you know, and rightly so. That's good that it, that you do have a bit of trepidation about that because it keeps you sharp and keeps you aware. Uh, I think that people are gonna get into trouble when. Um, they start getting too confident and I've been there myself where I've been too confident that uh, you know I've gotten into trouble and whatnot so yeah do have a look at that as well okay Brianna no please never break check somebody never 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 that's just dangerous and you're asking to be rear-ended if you're gonna do that to somebody don't do that you can tap your brakes to, to flash the brake lights on the back of the vehicle, but don't brake check them, okay? Just keep your space, keep the space in front of you, just breathe and relax and carry on, okay? Uh, JF 
essay have you ever heard the saying about how to escape a bear run faster than the other guy best way to escape a bear on the road don't drive slower than another guy yeah there you go and it's exactly it if you drive slower than other people eventually they're going to pass you they're going to take off and go do what they need to do and again it comes back to what i've said before about driving is is that you have to focus on what you're doing and this is this is an excellent point of what we're talking about in terms of social driving we get influenced by the behaviors of other people on the roadway and when you get pressured by this the actions and the behaviors of other people on the roadway you are putting yourself at risk because you are not focusing on what you're doing and so for both drivers that are working towards a license and drivers who are new to the driving environment if you allow yourself to be pressured by other drivers and you allow yourself to get distracted by that that's when you're at a high risk of being involved in a crash and you don't want to succumb to that pressure that's what i'm saying whether that person is another vehicle on the roadway or whether that is another person in your vehicle you want to resist the temptation of succumbing to that pressure of these other people who are saying oh you shouldn't drive like that you shouldn't do this and whatnot you are the best judge of your own driving abilities and do not drive beyond your own driving abilities because that's when you're going to risk being involved in a crash sebastian i'm also um So you, so Sebastian, it, it's still not clear to me whether the, this is this is a passenger in the vehicle. Um, okay, Edwin, I'm also afraid of looking like a rookie on the road. You know, okay, Edwin, never be afraid of looking like a rookie on the road. There are lots of people who don't have uh, high ability as a driver. So again, figure out what your driving ability is and focus on what you're doing. Just don't about what other people are doing on the roadway try not to get pressured by that we all look like rookies at some time i'm sure that some people look at me when i'm driving and they think oh my god that can't that guy can't drive because i still kind of drive my car as if i'm driving a big truck i roll up to the lights and then i time the light and i, t I wait for it to go green so i don't have to bring my vehicle to a stop so you know it's all a matter of perception okay so sebastian yes thank you for clarifying that sebastian so it is a a passenger in the vehicle and, and that's going to be even tougher for you Sebastian that people are this person is putting a lot of pressure on you but you have to try you just have to say to that person listen can you be quiet while I'm trying to drive because I need to drive otherwise you're going to put me at a risk of being in a crash and and you know I know that's going to be really tough for you but this is what you need to do in terms of being able to drive well and drive and improve your own driving skills do not drive beyond your own abilities Okay. Uh, Brianna. Okay, Brianna, it's going to depend on whether you're on a highway or whether you're on an interstate or a freeway. If you're on a highway, most of the time it kind of depends on the phys physical characteristics of the highway. But five miles an hour is usually enough. If you're on an interstate, you can do 10 miles an hour above the posted speed limit. And again, that's something that you have to judge in terms of your own driving ability. If you're not com comfortable driving above the posted speed limit and keeping up with traffic flow, then what I suggest to you is to just drive in the right-hand lane and that way all the other traffic is going to go be able to go past you and those types of things. Okay? Fawaz. <laughs> yes. Fawaz, that's a that's a police saying too. Fido, <laughs> F it, drive on. Uh, Janet, <clears throat> yes. There you go. Okay. All right. So, um, just let me know. A couple of people let me know they were from Chile and from other places in the world. Just let me know where you are if you're watching on the replay. Uh, if everybody could uh, hit the thumbs up if you're new to the channel and haven't subscribed yet if you could subscribe to the channel as well that would be really great and uh, make sure that you hit the bell there that way you'll get instant notification when I get the videos up for you and those types of things and I do requests for videos if you have a topic that you're working on and you're having some challenges and need a bit more information and those types of things by all means leave me a comment and uh, 
I'll be more than happy to help you out with those things and whatnot. So yeah, so everybody just give it a thumbs up and that really helps out the channel and those types of things. Okay, uh, Sebastian, I set up my navigation recently traveling cross state and my signal went out. I think was due to me failing to follow its instructions. <laughs> oh, you are most welcome, Hannah. Uh, Sebastian, I don't know that much about GPS, Sebastian, because I use my phone when I uh, do um, navigation. So I just use my phone and my phone tends to pick up fairly well in those types of things. So. Uh, what you can do, Sebastian, if you send me the kind of GPS that you have, I, I find it interesting that you're losing signal across state lines and those types of things because these things usually work fairly well uh, within the United States and whatnot. Okay. Sujana, hi there. How are you? <laughs> okay. So Janet is in Ontario. Fawaz is in Michigan. Riley, you're funny. What is a hoot? Oh, the hoodie. Oh, yes. My mom bought me this hoodie, Riley. <laughs> That's funny. There you go. Okay, I used my phone, and it was on my phone. I reached an area, and I lost my signal. Okay, Sebastian, that's not unusual. Uh, were you in a mountainous area? Because there's quite a number of places here in British Columbia where you will use lose your signal on a cell phone. So that is one of the things that happens. And so this is the other thing, Sebastian, uh, if you watch the route planning and navigation video, one of the things that I suggest to you is to have a look at Google Maps in conjunction with using your phone, because then that way you're gonna be able to sort of, you know, go back to your directions that you wrote out, and that way you won't be relying completely on your phone for purposes of navigation. And when it drops out and those types of things, that's gonna help you out. Uh, Dave is here, hi Dave. Uh, Rush Girl is in upstate New York. Uh, oncoming merging lanes. Uh, Rush Girl, what, what are you talking about in terms of uh, oncoming merging lanes? Are you talking about merging over on highways and interstates? Or are you talking about off ramps getting off the highway uh, to get onto another road and whatnot? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, Dave, yes, you did miss the presentation, but you can always watch it in the replay there. And uh, Dave, when I when I post it up again, I put the times down in the description there so you can just skip ahead to the presentation. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, so you get panicky when other people are merging in front of you. Uh, so what I suggest uh, in that sense, Rush Girl, is just when you see other people merging over, just let off the throttle a little bit and just you know increase the space a, a bit behind so that you have more of a gap between you and the people in front of you. And that way that'll make you feel better and, and less claustrophobic. Uh, Diego is from Costa Rica. <laughs> you are most welcome, Diego. My, my pleasure. Uh, I was depending solely on my phone and yes, the Google Maps lost the signal. <laughs> okay, Riley, or uh, uh, Sebastian there. You're gonna have to, yeah, just write it out that way. And, uh, Usually when you lose the signal on your phone, Sebastian, you're not gonna lose it for very long. You're gonna pick it up within a few miles. It'll come back again. And that's what happens here, places here in, uh, in British Columbia and whatnot. You'll lose the signal in the mountains and whatnot. <laughs> okay, also use a hiking GPS maps on the phone. Geological survey in conjunction with your GPS, you can find your way if you're totally lost. There you go. Okay, some good advice that Riley has there as well. Okay. All right, and you can and uh, Riley was saying that you can download maps as well on your phone. And there's lot. There's definitely a lot of apps for your phone. And whatnot, and but as the as Sebastian said, sometimes the signal on your phone will drop out. And the other thing about phones, uh, if you watch the video on navigation and route planning, uh, some of the places aren't on our phones. I mean, the other day when I was looking in Vernon here for the Greyhound station, the Greyhound station wouldn't come up my phone. So just know that as well. Okay. <laughs> 
Okay, 380. Uh, traffic driving in the center of the lane of a three-lane highway. Uh, if the right lane does not exit, do I pass them on the left or stay in the right as possible as I do now? Uh, 380, if you... Yeah, if you can avoid passing them on the right, then that's preferable. But if you have to, for whatever reason, then you're going to have to, right? Just, uh, you know, good scanning and those types of things. Chucky, how do you deal with, yeah, other truck drivers when you're trying to back into a spot? Uh, one of the things I might su suggest to you, Chucky, uh, Try and get into the truck stop a little bit earlier and that way you can get into a space you don't have to back into. Uh, try and get into a space that you can drive into and whatnot and that way it'll make it a bit easier for you. But um, just try and plan your, your route a little bit more so you can get in a bit earlier so that way you don't have to back in and you don't have to deal with these people. I've often found that if you get in there sort of four, five o'clock in the afternoon, most of these people, they're not in there and those types of things yet, okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> That's great. Sebastian had other people in the vehicle who could help him. Salman got my G2 last August. Any advice on preparing for my G? Yeah, Salman, have a look at the videos here on uh, passing a road test first time. All of those will help you with that. But there's because there's a lot of skills and they're expecting your driving to be at a higher level for your full G. Okay, but you need to have all the stuff in place, stopping at the right place at intersections. Uh, obeying the speed limit, uh, stopping at the right place in traffic and those types of things. So yeah, there's a fair bit of stuff that they want. Uh, okay, what is Tommy's asking? What is your suggestions for dealing with tailgaters? The tactic for dealing with to tailgaters, Tommy, is to increase your following distance in the front because now remember if somebody's tailgating you, you're now driving for yourself and that knucklehead behind you who's tailgating you. So increase the distance in front of you. That way you're not going to have to come, you're not going to have to do aggressive braking and those types of things. And you'll give that person behind you more time to uh, react when you do slow down and whatnot. Okay. Okay, 380's got some good advice there. Never hurts to ask other drivers. My first time in, another driver helped me understand the pumps. A good driver will help you in backing. I do not park in themselves, just help you. Yes, and that is excellent advice that 380 just gave you there. Chucky is ask other drivers. They are more than willing to help you and, and they will help you back in and those types of things and look and those types of things and help you out because we know it's tough and as well, for all the veteran drivers that are watching or maybe watching this video on the replay and those types of things, know that these people, unfortunately, the, the truck driving schools are doing new truck drivers a disservice. They do not teach them how to back up. So if you can help them out when they're new and they're not experienced in truck stops and those types of things, it's really, really great and helps to promote the industry and bring it back to those sort of days when people did help other drivers. So if you, if you need to help, that would be really great. Okay, so Sam said sometimes uh, GPS signals are lost uh, when driving underneath trains and here in New York under tall skyscrapers and those types of things. <laughs> yes, Riley agrees with them. Uh, Dave, uh, I wouldn't recommend driving without headphones. Do not underestimate the importance of sound while you're driving, okay? Mm -hmm. Anita, hi there, how are you? <laughs> That's great. Um, Okay, so what I suggest, Sebastian, if you're having difficulty finding the road, have a look at the night driving video. The night driving video, all of the skills and techniques that I talk about in the night driving video are the same for driving on roadways in inclement weather. What you need to do is you need to look for landmarks. You need to look for the utility poles along the roadway. You need to look for the concrete barriers, the reflectors, and those types of things that will help you to locate the roadway. And of course, the number one landmark for finding the roadway in inclement weather and when it's dark and when conditions are not ideal is uh, following other traffic because for the most part, you know, 90% of the time, other traffic is going to drive on the roadway in the lanes and those types of things. So that's the other way that you can 
uh, find the roadway and drive and drive at night and whatnot is to follow the other traffic and look for the landmarks along the roadway that are going to help you out and whatnot. So, all right. Uh, yeah. Okay. And the other thing, again, Sebastian, it comes back to social driving. If you're driving in inclement weather and you can't find the lanes and those types of things, uh, it, you have to focus on what you're doing, drive within your own abilities, and don't try and keep up with other traffic and other people who are driving that too fast and whatnot. Just stay over in the right-hand lane, drive at your speed within your abilities, and that way you're going to be okay in bad weather. Yeah, Tommy, I'm sure that's incredibly intimidating when truck drivers are tailgating you on a highway, especially when you don't have some place to get over and that they can't um, get past you and those types of things. Uh, yeah, Riley, yeah, especially right now with uh, the end of winter and the beginning of spring, the lane markings and those types of things are really uh, beginning to fade on the roadways and they're barely there. Uh, the other thing that will help you out is to look for the traffic signs because the traffic signs are often located near the side of the road and those types of things. And as well, traffic signs are reflective, so that's going to help you to locate where the road is as well. And there, uh, Corey has put up the video for us, and I do apologize, I neglected to introduce Corey. Bricks for Wheels, that's Corey. Corey moderates the channel for us here because uh, <laughs> you know that your channel is getting bigger when you get starting to get spammed and unfortunately uh, a couple of months back we got spammed pretty heavily so Corey's come in and helped us out and he's doing a really awesome job so thanks to Corey for that. Okay Dave McLean, have you ever boarded a ferry? Yes I have boarded a ferry and oddly enough <laughs> there's a video here on how to get on a ferry. It's, it's fairly straightforward, Dave, in terms of getting on a ferry. So, uh, yeah, have a look at that video and then uh, you can figure out about ferries and those types of things. Ferries are really great. Uh, I take the ferry. I have a house on Vancouver Island, so I take the ferry from Tawasson in Vancouver over to Schwartz Bay, which is one of the points of entry uh, over on Vancouver Island. And then I've been on the... Um, Washington State Ferries as well from Sydney, British Columbia over to, uh, oh, I forget what where the destination is. Maybe somebody might be able to know where the, the, the Blaine, not, not Blaine, Washington. Uh, anyway, it'll come to me here in a minute. But uh, I've been on that ferry as well. I really like the American ferries as well. And I've been on ferries around the world too. So it's, it's, it's a lot of fun if you get a chance. Uh, Dave, when was the last time? I got somebody trying to spam me tonight, actually. <laughs> and I got spammed a few weeks ago, which kind of threw me. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot going on at times. Okay, Anita. Anita, I don't have any videos, but within the next couple of months here, that's what I'm working on is I'm going to switch over to the trucks, and I'm going to do some shifting videos, and I'm going to do turning videos as well. Uh, in the trucks and get some of that stuff up for you because I I've, I've realized that I've talked all around trucks but uh, I've actually haven't videoed m myself in the truck driving the truck yet so that's that's the next uh, thrust of the channel is to start is to get back in the truck and, and do some more trucking videos and do turning and that sort of thing uh, Edwin I don't have any videos on avoiding debris in the, on the on the channel yet but if I find something uh, if I if that happens I'll definitely get that up but as I said I need to um... <laughs> Riley thank you for that uh, and you guys uh, Riley you guys have a video have a ferry the Staten Island ferry have you been have you been on the Staten Island ferry down there okay um... Right lane of oncoming traffic and the exit where the oncoming traffic is coming onto us. I thought it was safer. Um, Sebastian, I'm not certain what you're asking me there in that question. Traffic entering and exit, I assume, is generally slowing down. Yeah, but Sebastian, usually the, the traffic should be slowing down on the exit ramp, not out on the highway. Okay. Uh... Motorbike videos. Dave, that's another thing that's coming up is motorcycle videos. I haven't done any of those yet, but I will get those done too. There is just, there's a lot more stuff than I ever imagined I could do in terms of a YouTube channel. 
Okay, and there are school bus videos, Dave, uh, so that, have a look at those as well. You are most welcome, Edwin. <laughs> Riley, you don't like the color orange? Uh, I have seen it on, on television, but I've never actually seen on it. And um, Okay, and it doesn't accept cars. Um, wait a minute. What was the ferry in the latest Spider-Man movie that had cars on it? That was a ferry in New York, wasn't it? Because he lives in Queens. Yes. The Governor Governor's Island Ferry. There we go. Uh, Chucky, yes, I have. There are videos here on logbooks, so have a look at that. There's a whole playlist on uh, logbooks as well. And as well, Chucky, there are logbook courses on the Smart Drive Test website as well. So you can go over there and pick up one of the logbook courses, and those will definitely uh, give you help with all the logbook courses. And when you purchase my logbook courses, you also can ask me any questions you might have, and I'll help you with those as well. Okay? So I we're getting near the hour here. We've had a really good live stream tonight. Lots of great questions. Uh, and uh, somebody actually asked me about my fairy <laughs> my fairy video. So uh, yeah, so just again to reiterate, I lost my computer on uh, Friday and Saturday and I spent all day getting it back. So I'm gonna get back on track here. I did lose a day of work, which I realized I was a lot more tired than I would have liked to <laughs> admit when it did go down, but anyway. Oh, Sebastian, okay, what did you ask me? Which, uh, Sebastian, I'm sorry, which question did I skip? Because the question here about uh, stop between the right lane of oncoming traffic and the exit, where oncoming traffic is coming onto a slide. I don't understand that question, Sebastian. That's probably why I didn't answer it. Okay, school bus, there's the school bus. Okay, yeah, maybe, Sebastian, it didn't show up because uh, I didn't see it. So it wasn't that I was ignoring you, Sebastian. <laughs> but uh, definitely leave it there, Sebastian. Uh, I think what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up for tonight, and uh, we'll call that a night. Thank you, everybody, for your time and showing up uh, for the live stream. Uh, for those of you watching on the replay, be sure to hit that thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do subscribe to the channel. Uh, Oh, okay, Anita. I'm sorry, I misinterpreted you. Yes, there are vi there are videos here on left and right turns, uh, controlling the steering wheel, and there are videos on how to turn or corners and those types of things for the purposes of a road test and how to learn how to drive. Okay. Let's see pants. Ferry rhymes with scary. Highway between there is a section on the highway between the right lane of on flowing traffic and where cars are entering their exit. I stopped in the middle to pull over, or was it safe? Um, okay, Sebastian, you're gonna have to send me. You're gonna have to send me an email for that because I I still don't understand which you, where you're going when you're driving your car, okay? So I, I, my apologies, it just doesn't make sense to me where you're going in terms of that. So send me an email, rick at smart drive test, and I'll, I'll answer that for you, okay? Uh, Cedric, yes, tailgating is when the car behind you is following too close for you to be safe. That's, that's exactly what that is. Oh, okay, Sebastian, so you didn't want to pull over on the side of the road. Yes, that's good. But if you're in the lane of traffic and you're behind the traffic that's exiting off the highway, put your four-way flashes on to indicate to traffic behind you that you're coming to a stop on the roadway. Okay, that's what you need to do. Okay, Rush Girl, thank you so much. That is awesome. Good night, Edwin. There we go. Bricks for Wheels is the good thing for you. <laughs> thank you, Riley. And thank you, Sam. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, everybody. I'll be on here for a few minutes. If you have any questions, just leave me a comment. I'll be more than happy to help you out. For everybody that passed a road test in the last week, congratulations on that awesome work. And for those of you having a road test coming up this week, uh, good luck on your road test coming up. Remember, be safe out there. If you have any questions at all, leave me a comment down in the comment section. I'll be more than happy to get your answers and whatnot and help you out. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.